Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, also known as CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers. In addition with DSIAC, the Defense Systems, and HDIAC, which is the Homeland Defense System uh, Information Analysis Center, uh, all three of us are under DTIC, which is the Defense Technical Information Center within the Office of the Unders Undersecretary of Defense of Research and Engineering. Um, our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. We look to present an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. Overall, our organi organization supports those working in cybersecurity, specifically focusing on DOD research and engineering. Uh, we do this by helping to navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on some of their technical projects. In addition, we provide research and analysis services to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from the government, industry, and academia. Uh, with the goal to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. Thank you for joining today. We hope you enjoy this webinar and it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity. Uh, before we get started today, I just want to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you're dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI Act webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and you'll be able to find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Um, second, all participants are currently muted, um, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. This will allow you to chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you have a question for our presenters, um, please use the audience questions tool which is at the top center of your screen. Um, it's the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. Um, we hold all questions to the end. So at the end of the presentation, um, at that point, I will go over, go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those of you who are actually dialed in on the phone, I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. Um, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear, the full presentation will be available online. Um, within a day or two. Check back uh, to the CSI website once the webinar is posted. Uh, the go to webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. Um, and with that said, I'll hand it off to our presenters today. All right. Well, thank you, Phil. My name is Colin Dunn, CEO of FEN. I'm joined today by Tapan Patel from the Army Corps of Engineers, Erdic Searle. And we're excited to share information today about a class of technology you might have heard of, but haven't heard about in a while, or might be new to you altogether. And that's data diodes. And you'll learn all about them and how they've changed a lot over the last few years and what's made them a practical alternative to firewalls and software-based security um, that, uh, that you should consider next time you're looking to get data out of an industrial control system. Uh, Philip, could I do a quick sound check? There was a chat said somebody couldn't hear. Sure, no problem. Um, I can hear you on, on my end. Um, I okay. think you should be good to go, but... Um... Sounds great. Okay. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, on the next slide here. Here we go. So today we'll talk about data diodes, the technology where it's been, where it's going, and some use cases you may not have thought of if you're familiar with the technology uh, where you could use this today. We're also gonna speak about the project that evaluated this technology recently under the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. And this project was actually uh, won the project of the year for energy installation and water. And Tapan Patel will talk to you about the evaluation from a technical and a cybersecurity side about how this technology performed. And then we'll open it up to questions. So 
So first we'll dive into data diodes as a technology, what's new and where it's going. I think the, this audience here is probably aware of the cybersecurity threats on our nation's infrastructure and all around the world. And as infrastructure managers look to get a better handle of what's happening with their equipment in real time, they need that intelligence to help uh, send the right person with the right tool at the right time and to see if equipment's about to fail. If there's a noise in the data coming out of that equipment that might allow them to shut down equipment before a catastrophic failure or even to skip maintenance if something's doing particularly well. That information lets them supplement manpower with data so that they can operate more effectively. And bringing that equipment into the industrial internet of things is really valuable from a sustainability as well as resilience perspective. But unfortunately, the connectivity that's made that all possible has opened the door to cyber attack. And we're not just talking about on the OT or the IT side of the house, the information technology side, but the OT, the operational technology side, where attacks, including ransomware, threaten this equipment and are driving some to wonder if they should disconnect and go back to living with an air gap, to go back to not knowing what's happening just because the stakes are so high on these industrial control systems. But thankfully, there's a class of technology out there that allows you to get the information you need and the security you deserve, and that's data diodes. They physically block outside cyber attacks while allowing you to get that information. That makes this technology fundamentally different from the software-based cybersecurity or firewalls that have been around for a long time. Data diodes provide that physical blocking mechanism, that check valve for data that allows it to go in only one direction. And it's a technology that was fairly obscure for a long time, and we'll talk about where it used to be used and now where it's going, but it's gotten a lot more attention this past year since the Colonial Pipeline attack, for example. We've seen guidance come out of the DHS Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency, or CISA, recommending the use on multiple occasions of one-way communication diodes or unidirectional gateways or data diodes. These are all different terms for similar products. They can be used to protect control system boundaries and they can be used to limit the control, uh, limit and control the flow of data coming into or out of these really critical networks. And they do that by um, turning data into light and then getting that data off to where it needs to go. It's a transformation from this electronic, you know, typical you know, TCP connection into a one-way stream of data into a beam of light is usually the way that this happens. They're turning data into light and then back again, getting it off to where it needs to go. That's often the cloud. That can be another part of a campus. It could be another part of a utility territory, but it turns data into a one-way broadcast, which even though it's a short distance represents uh, an air gap so that you can get the information you need, but there's no physical channel to get that data back in. It's that physics that really separates this from those software-based security uh, that has really dominated the market for so long. And by getting this information into your hands, you can improve your efficiency. You can find operational savings that may not have been obvious to a human operator, but you can use the power of predictive analytics in the cloud and machine learning to, to find opportunities while allowing your human operators to make those final decisions. You can also get information that might get you more time to help reduce interruption, to help reduce unexpected equipment failure, that it might be a, a chiller at a hospital or a data center, for example. The, the heating and cooling equipment itself may not be that important, but what they serve, the mission is so incredibly important. You need that uptime, you need to save lives, you need to keep that data flowing allows you to get that information and you can get it without having to have somebody drive around and get that data manually. If you have systems that are not connected uh, to the internet of things today, you can increase the productivity of those teams by sending them with the right tool at the right time and know what problem they might be facing and not have to go out, do some investigation and then come back. Increasing that productivity is really important now, especially since we've seen a big um, shortage of qualified workers, we need to, to really use that maintenance team resource really effectively. And you can get that data without somebody using that, that connectivity to steal information. Now they may, there are folks that might be penetrating a network to steal uh, sensitive information and they are opportunistic. They make it onto the OT network from the IT network. 
or they might be looking to s steal trade secrets or information about how a factory is operating. That, that data is really important. You see a lot of factory owners not wanting to hook up the factory floor to the cloud, for example, because they're worried about intellectual property theft. But you also have to worry about attackers injecting ransomware, not just on the IT networks, but the OT networks. A lot of these controllers are running some version of Windows and they could be held for ransom themselves. And you might have a backup copy of information, but you might not have a backup copy of that chiller plant or that substation equipment that was took a really long time to get a new one put in before the pandemic. And now with supply chain shortages, you might be waiting years to get a replacement part. So it's really critical that nobody gets in there and takes control or holds it for ransom. And it's the ability to modify or destroy equipment like the attack on the Ukrainian power grid a few years ago that really got me into the business because I don't want someone to have to worry about whether the, the water is safe to drink or other basic services are no longer available. It's keeping the keeping those attackers out of those systems that is of particular importance when lives are on the line. And for those where there's no backup copy or where the mission is really critical or where people's lives are at stake, you need better than firewalls. You can't trust software to help keep you safe all the time. You need to trust physics. Now software based security and firewalls, they rely on patches and updates to help keep your defenses up to date and really help you protect against known threats. But it's those unknown threats of tomorrow and the ones that are lingering today that haven't been caught that represent a real gap in our defenses. So for those systems where you just cannot afford to let a single malicious bit get upstream, that's where data diodes come in. And they've been around as a class of technology for even a couple of decades and got their start in some really high-end applications like nuclear power plants, where you just cannot afford to let somebody into those systems, but your operators also need to get that information off to engineering teams. There's also use cases uh, from the intelligence community where you might be using a, a data diode to pull data into a network, where in combination, that data is really valuable, is really dangerous perhaps, and you can't let it go back out. And with these beginnings in some very high-end places, they often came with complexity. They also came with uh, very high-end price tags. You could easily spend $100,000, even a quarter million dollars on one of these legacy data diodes that would then also need to be customized by the, by the team that makes these. You might have to have somebody fly out to do commissioning on them. Uh, they were complex. You might need to have additional servers to Shovel, shovel data into that one-way data diode and then have a, a receiving server that might have some proxy installed on it. So they were complex, they were expensive. They really were meant to live in an IT cabinet or a, or a data center. And for a lot of these reasons, it limited their appeal to places like facility-related control systems at a military installation or a factory floor, even on construction equipment or uh, uh, shipping, for example places where you have a lot of assets, not necessarily a lot of data to send, but the data that you are sending is really important and you cannot let somebody get back in. That's where data dives have come a long way in the last couple of years. The prices now have fallen some 95% for industrial data diodes. And you've got options out there today that don't require that you install any software on either end of the transaction. Like everything can be self-contained into one small device that might fit in an equipment cabinet. Um, and it's also the usability has Come such that on the industrial side, if you speak a typical protocol like Modbus or BACnet, or even want to send files in a one-way FTP fashion, it's the sort of thing where it's easy enough now to have your own team do that installation and you don't need somebody to come fly out or even train you how to do it. So be between the costs coming down, the usability going up, it's a technology that you consi should consider now because it can be cost competitive even at first cost with an industrial firewall. And if you have a process in your, your plant today, for example, where you Say, hey, I burn a DVD every night. You know, DVDs are a couple of cents. That's not a big deal. Even if it only costs your team five minutes a day to burn that DVD and walk it across an air gap, you'd be talking thousands of dollars of labor over the course of a year. And a data diet can pay for itself really quickly on cost alone. But again, it's that physical uh, protection against cyber attack that really makes the data diode appeal to folks that want to make sure that they protect against the attacks of today and tomorrow, but they still want to keep a human in the loop. So that's one thing about data diodes, the bad traffic's not getting in, but the good traffic is not either. So this is, you'd put one where you might be drawing a boundary in a facility or in a system where you want to make sure that you're just wanting to get that data out, uh, but not necessarily needing a two-way conversation. 
Uh, now you can, uh, with some of these data diodes in the market today, have that three-way handshake on either way, either side of the data diode. You can get acknowledgments that the data was sent. That data is then sent from the protected side to the output side or the uh, the world side, and then you can have a net, again, you can have a TCP uh, connection. You can have a three-way handshake. Make sure that data gets off to where it needs to go. But in the middle, there is that one-way physically enforced connection. There's a lot of places that you could put data dive today, not just military intelligence, but we're talking about you know, a couple hundred thousand facilities across the Department of Defense or every substation in, in an electric utility. Uh, but even it's practical now to put on commercial buildings where you might have a hundred buildings in a portfolio. They're of different ages and they have different system types. Getting all that data into one place and sending the right maintenance person can save you a lot on your operations. Uh, across IT and OT uses, you know, as, as well, utilities separating the OT network from the IT network. We talked about manufacturing a bit. And just digging into some specific use cases, you, know, you might want to stream industrial data. I mean, you may want to rem remotely monitor a facility that's on the other side of a campus. It could be on the other side of town. It might be using an industrial protocol like BACnet. You can use a diode to listen in on that network to get the information that you need and then send it off to a remote server so that your engineering teams can know what's happening. You could also use it to send uh, log files or CSVs or any kind of file you might wanna use in a one-way file transfer. And so this could be a, a traditional IT setting. You're send, sending files from one network to another and you can have that physical air gap in one direction and that stream of file in the other with these next generation data diodes. On the industrial side, you often have an opportunity to use a data logger, you might be bringing data from many parts of a building or many parts of a factory, you're generating files and you can aggregate that information and use a one-way FTP function and get that off to some other remote server for your engineering teams to know what's happening. And that can really improve uh, the time to action if you have a data logger that's sitting behind an air gap. We see that with some government uh, energy savings performance contracts where that data might sit on site being dumped onto a hard drive for six months, and then you go pick up that hard drive, and then you take it back to the engineering team and say, oh, I missed something that happened four months ago. I could have saved a lot of money if we had addressed it. You can get those files a lot quicker. What's really exciting about this next generation of data diode hardware is that it can open the door to the cloud for a lot of systems that used to have to live behind an air gap. And that can be you know, a facility-related control system. It could be any other you know, sort of energy asset. Get that data, send it out to the cloud. That could be any, a variety of cloud providers. And then get that data via API or directly to third-party analytics. And use the power of machine learning and AI to help your team know where they should go, but not necessarily the AI telling your equipment what to do. It tells your people what to do, but your, the humans are still in the loop. Your team's still making decisions. And that's a, that's a mode of operation that we run into a lot of folks that are comfortable with that. They want to help prioritize their team's time. They're not ready to hand the keys over to the cloud for their operations entirely. And that opening the door to the cloud also is applicable on the government side. You know, sending that data to federally approved cloud providers, to government approved analytics that have been through the FedRAMP process, for example. This ability to cross an air gap is really exciting and, and opens the door to uh, yeah, operational savings in a lot of different ways. So we talked about some of the different use cases and before I hand it over to Japan here, just to review, you can use data diodes for remote monitoring of industrial equipment. You can use it to bridge the gap between an OT network and an IT network. You know, it can be something where you're connecting a historian off to the engineering team, even off to the billing department, to make sure that nothing gets back into that water treatment plant, for example or you can use it to make secure backups of information. You might have the original data and you just wanna share copies of it with folks. There's applications across law enforcement and industrial where you wanna make sure that nobody's getting into the original uh, version of that evidence of that data, that they're only working with a copy and you can continuously uh, replicate that data. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Tapan, who's gonna discuss the, the recent ESTCP project and go into the methodology and the results. All right, well, thank you, Colin, I appreciate it. And good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you're all doing well. I <clears throat> apologize a little bit for the camera angle here, but my wife tells me this is the better side of my face. So 
um, hopefully you all agree. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, over the next few slides about the program uh, that we use to evaluate these data diodes. So as Colin had mentioned, my name is Stepan. I'm with the uh, Engineering Research Development Center. We're part of the research arm of the core. And our goal was to study the diodes, uh, both from a functionality standpoint, as well as a cybersecurity standpoint, and determine uh, if this is something we can use uh, within the Army, within the DOD, uh, for the use case of transferring data from some of our control systems. And so uh, kind of at a snapshot, um, the ESCCP program, um, we won the uh, Project of the Year Award. And uh, over the next few slides, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what that process was. So uh, Colin, if you don't mind, next slide, please. All right. So we had three main objectives for this uh, particular project. The first was to demonstrate that the uh, diode did indeed provide physical isolation. Uh, the method we used to do this, uh, there's a couple uh, of our partners that we worked with. The first is the Threat Systems Management Office. Uh, they're a team uh, based in Huntsville, Alabama, and they are essentially one of the Army's red team um, penetration testing uh, entities. So they have the ability to go in and essentially try to break whatever product um, or find a way around it uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. Uh, so we send them uh, a few of the diodes, and then we also worked with uh, the Naval uh, Facility uh, folks, uh, they have a lab called the Control System Testbed, CSTB for short. Um, they also have some capabilities to do some uh, uh, pen testing. Uh, they have a variety of uh, control systems that they all they can also do testing with. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the results from those, but essentially um, the diodes did perform as expected, and uh, we were able to verify that with both team partners. The second objective was to show the uh, applicability of the diode across uh, various DOD uh, systems. Um, so within the DOD, uh, because we have such a large building footprint, uh, most of our control systems, facility control systems, are standardized um, amongst uh, BACnet, LAN, Modbus, and FTP type um, uh, protocols. Um, you know, we're fully aware there's there's lots of other protocols out there. Um, you know, some proprietary, some non-proprietary, uh, but those are kind of the major ones that are out there in our systems, and so that's what we tested. And so um, uh, most of our tests included putting the diode in, in a few different scenarios. We looked at whether it was able to uh, recognize the protocol correctly, uh, offload the protocol and, or excuse me, offload the data, and, um, you know, we compared the uh, the data before installing the diode and after the diode just to make sure that the integrity of the data was not lost. And then the last piece was to evaluate the long-term device performance. Uh, this was really driven at, uh, you know, what happens if we put the diode in for a few months? Uh, does it continue to collect data? Um, are there any potential operational issues uh, in long-term data collection? Uh, things like that. And so we'll go on to the next slide, please. All right. So, um, you know, at a high level, um, because we can't get into some of the specifics on, in, you know, this type of environment, but, um, you know, in general, the diodes did perform as expected. Uh, a lot of the uh, tests that were thrown at the diode, um, uh, you know, we were able to verify that the diode was secure. It did transmit it in a one-way manner. Um, you know, for those of you that are on the DOD side, uh, we do have uh, some reports we can share with you. Uh, please get in touch with either myself or Colin, and we'd be happy to share. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for this particular test, uh, the penetration testing. I'll go to the next slide, please. All right, so the compatibility tests, um, as I mentioned previously, we did focus on, on uh, these four protocols here. Uh, what you'll see in the diagram here is we um, analyzed a few different scenarios. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, with BACnet, for example, um, you know the two kind of modes you can use. Uh, you can use BACnet over uh, IP is is a protocol that's uh, fairly common out there. Uh, the other is you can use BACnet uh, MSTP, uh, which is a, a non-IP protocol. Um, for our purposes within the DoD, uh, there's scenarios where we would want to export data from various points within our control system. Um, you know, that'd be at the level level one level, level two, 
Uh, it could be after some of our firewalls. Um, and so really the purpose of this testing was to see um, where within our network architectures can the diodes export the data. And so that's primarily why we looked at uh, IP protocols and non-IP protocols. Um, you know, the details of the test, uh, you know, again, we're happy to discuss in, in more detail offline. Uh, but what we found is that of the four protocols here, the diode was able to successfully transmit um, those protocols. And uh, what that means is it provides us the flexibility to implement the diodes in a variety of systems. Um, some of our installations uh, within the Army, um, you know, may have uh, some sampling of each of these protocols. And so we want to make sure that the diodes are able to export from all of those systems. Uh, other installations have standardized amongst uh, one or maybe two protocols. And so uh, really the goal of this test was to make sure that we have the flexibility that we need. And, uh, you know, we found that the diode does indeed offer that. All right, I'll go to the next slide, please. All right, so the long-term tests, um, this was one of the buildings um, that we tested in. Uh, we, we have two other buildings at Searle, uh, essentially where we put in the diodes, uh, we monitored the, uh, the data, uh, both before installing the diode and after installing the diode for about two months. Um, and there's kind of two main purposes for this long-term test. The first was to make sure that, um, you know, there weren't adverse events happening, um, you know, after a certain period of time. So, you know, let's say the diode works for a week. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, there's no downtime. We want to make sure that, it, you know, it doesn't randomly appear to turn off or, or uh, stop collecting data or, or transmitting data. Uh, so really the first part of the test was aimed at stability. And then the second part of the test was uh, making sure that the integrity of the data is also there. Um, you know, without getting into too much detail, the data does have the, the diode does have the ability to uh, repackage some of the data and, and, and uh, for the end user to make it easier to read and understand. And so we want to make sure that the integrity of the data uh, coming into the diode is not affected. Um, and so uh, again, the diode was able to pass both of those tests. Um, we were able to successfully transmit our uh, facility control system data and uh, meet the end, end objectives that we were after um, uh, for this project. Go on to the next slide, please. All right, so, um, you know, <clears throat> part of this effort, um, the testing was focused at Searle. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we worked with some of our Army and Navy partners. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, a lot of our facilities at the DOD level uh, are operated, uh, you know, fairly similarly uh, across the Navy, our Air Force and Army. And um, our goal is to increase access to building performance data. Um, if anyone has worked with the DOD, uh, you'll realize that we do have some significant challenges with that, um, you know, partially due to cybersecurity, uh, partially uh, due to funding, partially, you know, there's a few other reasons. Uh, but being able to offload our data from our control systems uh, gives us a lot of opportunity to improve how we're currently operating our buildings. Um, you know, if we can't access the data, then having some of these control systems in place really doesn't help us much. So um, getting access to the data and being able to analyze it is, is definitely um, one of the key things we're looking for here. Um, in a lot of cases, um, especially with legacy systems, uh, those that may not be able to meet current cybersecurity standards, um, adding this diode offers a level of security that is otherwise difficult to achieve under our traditional uh, networking um, uh, you know, schemes or, or uh, approvals. Um, so, you know, as Colin mentioned, you know, traditionally we just air, cap, air gap one of our systems and somebody would have to go in there, uh, you know, biweekly, monthly, uh, maybe every six months uh, with some CDs um, and then offload that data. And it's very labor intensive. So uh, putting this diode in um, with the testing that we've, uh, we've, we've shown, uh, it does add a level of security to our systems. And so it can help us uh, comply with some of our cybersecurity requirements. Uh, integrating the data from multiple sources is also important. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, some installations may have uh, three to four different protocols. 
And uh, in the past, if we were trying to, um, you know, collect all of that data into one, say, central server or central database or repository, again, we'd have to go in, uh, collect a bunch of c CDs, and then manually transfer that data into a central server, and then process it from there. Uh, by adding a few diodes, we can combine all of those uh, control system data into one source, uh, you know, relatively easily, and that just uh, uh, allows us to be a lot more efficient in analyzing our data. Um, and then all that to say uh, is by adding diodes into our control systems, uh, you know, where appropriate, it, it definitely increases our efficiency. Uh, with that, we can analyze the data better, we can make the changes that are needed, and at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to save energy. We're trying to save the costs. Um, a lot of these control systems um, have a lot of data that uh, we uh, sometimes struggle to offload. And so just having access to that data um, and being able to do something about it is, is uh, very useful. Uh, so I'll go, go to the next slide, please. All right, and, and then I'll hand it back to Colin uh, to wrap it up. Thanks, Tapan. So we'll open it up to questions in just a moment here, but you know, just to summarize, we've been through a bit of an overview of what data diodes can do, where they've come from and where they're going. We talked about the ESTCP project used to evaluate them for uh, pulling data out of facility-related control systems. And one thing I want you to take away, especially if data diodes are new to you, is that data diodes provide physical cybersecurity. It makes them appropriate choice for those places where you need to monitor very sensitive equipment or get data out in a physically enforced one-way fashion. We'll go ahead and leave our contact information up here and uh, hand it back to Philip uh, in case there's anything else before we get to questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Um, very interesting work, very important work that, um, that, you, that you guys are doing. Um, we have a lot of engagement from our membership. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to moderate some of the questions that we have received. Um, before I go into some of the ones that were submitted directly through the audience questions, which I'll be able to visually show on the screen as well, I will um, go over some of the questions we, we received in the attendee chat as well. Um, so the first question we got is from SL. It says, so you guys are talking about diodes that don't support TCP. So that's, um, you know, it's going to, there's a lot of different vendors. And so some are going to handle TCP, some of them are, and some of them are going to handle it in different ways. So I can speak to how some of these work, where you might, you know, in a TCP connection, you might be expecting that handshake. You might want to be able to know that a packet was received and then you go get the next one. Um, you know, I can speak to our technology here where we have you know, processing power on either end of the box. Uh, but this might be something that is true if you have additional service on either side with an you know, alternative, alternative to this. But you can have a connection and have that handshake happen with one side of the box, with you know, the protected input side of the box, get that next packet, send an acknowledgement, and then the diode itself is turning that data into light, shining it over here, and then having another conversation where that data uh, is then sent packet by packet off to where it needs to go. So you can have both sides think they're talking to somebody. You're not just, you know, plugging a plugging a wire in either side, but rather you're able to s satisfy that handshake. Thanks. The next question we have is from Gary uh, Rymar. He says, "Why would an op optical dial like that's like the one on the chart be so expensive? I can understand the CDS being that expensive, but that's a different animal." Yeah, so the, you know, the, the cross-domain solution set, you know, the diodes, there's a lot of overlap. There's certainly different and some software-based uh, cross-domain solutions. But those all have all really got their root in a very expensive part of the market. You know, getting your systems uh, installed into the intelligence community um, is the, the sort of application is not necessarily as price sensitive. And so in part, the expense came from a lack of competition in the space. You know, there's an expectation that this uh, needed needed to be expensive, that there wasn't a lower cost alternative. So the entry of additional competition in the space has brought prices down, especially for industrial focused diodes. It's uh, 
it's, it's really become quite a bit more affordable if you've got some good options out there. The uh, Another reason that these had been really expensive is because you might start with really expensive you know, fiber optic switch gear and cut the pieces out you don't need. You know, the bill of materials was actually really high to make these, and there might be a fairly high uh, you know, initial quality problem that might have, you might have to make several of them to get a good one. Um, the, qu the quality of manufacturing has gone up as well as the fact that you can you know, design a data dive from the ground up to be affordable. Uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's not a reason for these to cost $100,000. Know, generally, I think I saw another question Rough order of magnitude, you, you've got good options. Um, you know, all of our products happen to be less than five thousand dollars. I can I see there continuing to be competition in the market, and it's already getting to be on par with um, industrial industrial firewalls without that ongoing patch maintenance cost. Great. Uh, so you answer actually two for one, but I'll I'll read that question aloud as well. Uh, Question from Timothy Perkins: What's the current current rough order magnitude cost for data dials of the sort you are describing to support monitoring and FRCS, um, which you which you just answered? Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is: How do you reconcile this with academic literature showing compromise of similar dials or extensive classified research in this domain? So when it, when it comes down to similar data diodes, you know, there are different construction methods. Um, and you know, there, certainly there is, uh, you know, the Israelis, for example, are very good at doing research where they try to exploit um, things like the, the vibration of a fan or the blinking of a light to, to, to try to pull data out of those systems. Um, and then others may be constructed in such a way where there is a physical channel for an outsider to get back in. It may not be actual optical isolation, but uh, some other uh, type of isolation, even logical isolation. So it, it's going to vary based on the manufacturer. Uh, and so really those results will, are the something that you probably want to see uh, from any of those. I will say in the use case we're talking about here, generally the systems themselves are more valuable than the information. You know, we happen to encrypt the data as it is in transit, but you know, it's generally the customers that we work with are more worried about somebody taking taking out the water treatment plant, uh, doing damage to the factory floor, and they're really worried about somebody sending a signal back in. All right, and our next question is from David Berger. He says, is a single da data dial considered a cross-domain solution? And can you discuss the differences between a single data dial and dual data and dual data dial CDS also will be interested in the application of data dials in DOD environments. Sounds good. So, you know, the, the definition of a cross domain solution, it can vary depending on the customer. You know, there are some folks that have a very IT focused um, uh, view of that, you know, transferring files, you know, doing database uh, replication, things like that. And sending that data in one direction can satisfy some of those. And especially on the industrial side, a single data diode can be considered to be that. For dual diodes, you know, sometimes you've got folks that want to have data you know, leaving a facility, um, or and this could be on the IT or the OT side. They want to get data out in one direction, but they might want to send data back in in the other direction. And so they'll put in two diodes. And there are some advantages to that. If you need to have you know, two channels of information, having that data diode go on the way back in helps prevent somebody from getting an acknowledgement that they successfully executed an attack. So it's a little bit more complex architecture um, than you might use for monitoring a building, but it's something that is an option for you. Um, you know, across DOD, certainly there is the, the IT applications we've talked about. We've talked about um, facility-related control systems. We talked about optimizing getting the data from um, energy savings performance contracts, but there's other applications like microgrids. Uh, I think there's a great future in the monitoring of legacy weapon systems, for example, you know, stuff where you might be getting data out with even a floppy disk today. Um, it is, is, lives with an air gap, but it can be very expensive to get that information. It can be very manually intensive. Uh, lots of applications there, keeping an eye on some of that uh, data as part of sustainment. Great. Our next question is from Sarah Formwalt. Can the pen test results reports be sent to someone within the Department of Interior? 
Yeah, I'll uh, give that one to Japan. You know, certainly, we have a, a summary that we can share, but um, Japan, in terms of process there. Yeah, um, if you can send us an email, uh, we can evaluate that. Um, you know, the data does become CUI at some point, but I, I think we can uh, within the federal government. I think I think we should be okay. But yeah, if you can send us an email to follow up, we can uh, we'll get back to you. Sounds good. Uh, next couple of questions from James Novak. Does it handle protocols that require handshaking? Um, can it confirm data integrity? Yeah, so kind of two questions, two questions there. Uh, I mentioned a bit about being able to establish that handshake, you know, on either side of this of our diodes at least. You know, you can say, give me the next piece of information and and validate that that has been successful, and then send that data to the other side using light. And then have another set of conversations. And that could be you know, with another network. It could be with a cloud provider that wants that acknowledgement. Um, and th those conversations might be happening at different speeds. So the ability to break that up and make sure that that payload gets across and off where it needs to go is, is very important. You know, that can be other, you know, TCP, for example, establish a TCP connection. Um, there are some modes where you might just be listening in to a network. And then there's others where you might need to be doing active polling. So you might want to go get specific Modbus registers, you know, the ability to go ask for those and then get that data again over and over every few seconds till the end of time, send it to the other side until somebody or some system requests that information. Those are some different ways that you could use this technology. Um, in terms of data integrity, you know, different vendors do that different ways. Um, I won't go into some of the, the internal guts of the ways that we do it, we do have some methods to make sure that that information came across uh, completely. Next question from Mike. Uh, he would like to know if the presentation is available for download. I'll put a link uh, to our website uh, where we do have the, the slides up as of right now. Um, I just put that link in the attendee chat so you can go there to get a copy of, the, of today's slides. Uh, the next question is from Mark Jackson. Uh, for the DOD environment, what specific cybersecurity requirements were tested for compliance? So the uh, the uh, mm -hmm. penetration testing done by the uh, uh, Threat Systems Management Office and the Navy's Control System Testbed uh, was a lot of active testing there. Uh, before I hand it to Japan, you know, there are some other um, certifications that some folks look at for IT-based systems like NIAP, like Common Criteria. And those are standards that haven't quite caught up with data diodes yet, even though they have been uh, around for some time. There's no protection profile uh, via NIAP. So it's an interesting um, an interesting challenge there. And we, the folks that we deal with are really interested in the actual penetration test results. Um, Japan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Colin. Um, I'll echo you know, what you said. Um, when we first approached TISMO, um, with this, you know, we looked at whether there were existing standards out there um, that we could apply, um, and, and there really weren't. But, um, you know, we took this as any kind of system. We didn't particularly uh, try to say, hey, what kind of, um, you know, we, we were looking at the threats, right? So we were looking at what kind of attacks can you feasibly uh, potentially carry out on a device like this? So. Uh, you know, we tested things like password complexity. We tested things like buffer overflow vulnerabilities. We tested things like, um, you know, is the grounding on the device accurate so that someone, you know, can't, uh, 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 you know, go back upstream unintentionally. So um, before we started the testing, we worked with the red team folks to come up with a list of uh, tests that uh, we think um, as a team could offer a reasonable um, uh, a reasonable method of, of attack uh, against the diode, and then we test it against those. Um, there just really isn't anything, um, you know, out there right now uh, that's built specifically for uh, diodes. Everything is is targeted towards the IT IT type devices. Thank you. The next question we had is is from Christopher Tony. Can you talk about how integrity of data is verified once it passes through data? Do you just trust everything that comes out of the diode? So I, I mentioned, 
I mentioned there's some different ways that different vendors handle this, um, but there are and that generally uh, trade secrets that go on. We can certainly get into some more details outside of this call, um, but those um, uh, methods are something that can be something that is incorporated into the data throughput speed. You know, you might be able to you know, blast data through at a really high speed but with some losses, and if you slow things down, you don't get those losses. And those sorts of things go into the actual data throughput ratings of these devices. Next question is from Patrick Simone. How does data diodes deal with DOD, FISMA, GRC, NIST, RMF, and affect 853 Rev5? I haven't, haven't memorized all of 853. Uh, Tapan, have you, do you have a thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, we did look through 853, um, 882 to identify any controls that were relevant to the diodes. Um, you know, one of the challenges is that both, you know, anything within RMF is looking at a system as a whole, uh, whereas we were looking particularly just at the diode. Um, now, there, so there were a handful of controls, you know, one example is, is uh, password complexity um, and a few others that we did test against as part of our red team. Um, so that's where we kind of incorporated those uh, RMF publications or NIST publications. Uh, but again, uh, evaluating it solely against those doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we're not looking at an entire system, you know, just for this particular project. All right, our next question is from James Sparenberg. How does this tech play out with dealing with compliance, SOX, banking, et cetera? So um, you know, that, that's a question where I think we might want to dig in more deeply you know, on another conversation. But generally, there's not going to be a lot of prescriptive guidance that are specifying the use of data diodes. It's just really some of that general guidelines have just started coming out last year as this technology has um, you know, from CISA, for example. Um, so generally folks aren't even aware of this, you know, the, even, even within the DOD side, the research done under ESTCP is still in the process of being incorporated into guidance documents. So happy to follow up afterward, but in, in general, if you need to set a boundary, if you need to do network segmentation, um, this is a great opportunity to provide that at a, a physical barrier for that segmentation, whereas otherwise you might be using logical. Okay. Our next question is from Christopher Tony. Can you compare and contrast this with the AWS diode? Interested specifically in ATO information. So um, on the ATO side, uh, you know, this device does not yet have like a type ATO. And I think that's in part because it's not really a system, um, but rather a component. Um, there's been some discussion that this would make it much easier to get an ATO. Um, and to pan, I don't know if you had wanted to add additional uh, things to that? Um, yeah, just a couple of points. Um, what you said is accurate. Um, you know, we did investigate whether it's possible to get a type ATO, but again, it's not a system. It does make it more difficult. Um, you could definitely argue that that adding this diode into uh, your system boundary uh, doesn't increase this, you know, security and therefore make it easier to get an ATO. Um, as far as the AWS diode, and, and Colin, I'll let you talk about other use cases, but as far as what we looked at, um, a lot of the facility control systems uh, within the Army and, and in the DoD are, are not cloud-based, um, and, and you know it's probably a long ways out before they are cloud-based. Um, so this, we didn't specifically look at that application. Um, you know, I would argue that if we had systems that were cloud-based and um, secured in that manner, um, you know, we may use the AWS diode in those cases, but again, that's, that's definitely not something that um, is uh, used at large within the DOD FRCS community. Yeah, and there's an opportunity there to actually get, uh, potentially get an ATO for that. If you draw the, as a, a type ATO, if you draw that boundary sort of at the diode and then off to that cloud connection, um, you know, that, is a, that being a consistent system, if that be uh, something that could open the door to the cloud potentially between systems that have ATOs and FedRAMP systems, for example, this connection in the middle uh, is exciting in, in the near future here for that connection to AWS. In terms of the hardware that enables connection to AWS, for us at least, you know, there's 
uh, each of our models can directly connect to AWS. It's just a matter of how you want to configure it. Okay. Uh, next question from Patrick, can the product become virtualized in lieu of a physical device? So there are, there are folks that um, try to sell software diodes. Some of them are even like a Raspberry Pi and they say, no, we make sure that somebody doesn't have access. It's an air gap, but it's, you know, there are, there's that physical connection um, and there is the opportunity for somebody to exploit not yet known threats. And this is, you know, this is where some of those academic research into the, the vulnerabilities at the real core of some operating systems or even some processor types, you know, that's where that could be exploited. Um, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I got my start designing heating and cooling and control systems. And it's that physical barrier that really, uh, that I, I, I liked the concept and that I, I enjoyed that, it had been places before, but that we could take it to new places. Um, so for those that don't feel like they need to have that physical barrier, that they can live with something that's more like a firewall when it comes down to it, even if it is something that is making it virtually, making a device on network virtually invisible, it's still there and there is an opportunity for someone to exploit that without the physical barrier. Okay, our next question from David Elliott, has the Army certified Defend Devices and is it on the approved list? Um, Tapan, you want to talk about process on that one? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so we are not, we have not uh, certified, the Army has not certified these devices. Um, for, there's two reasons for that. One, there is no um, certification program for control system devices. So at CERL, we did the testing, you know, we'll provide that report to say, here's what we found. Um, but we're not saying we're certifying it in any, any manner. Um, same thing with the approved list. There's an approved products list for IT systems, um, but the Army does not currently have an approved uh, products list for uh, control systems. And so if and when that does happen, you know, we can certainly look at um, evaluating the dive according to those standards. Um, but uh, just want to be clear that you know we're we're not independently certifying this for the army. Um, this was a a project we we evaluated and you know we can share the results. Okay. Next question from James Sparenberg. What is the current bandwidth of a single data diode? So there's a, a big range. You, know, you can get multi gigabit diodes, and they tend to be quite a bit more expensive. These might be six figure purchases. Um, that's a whole lot of bandwidth uh, for an industrial control system. You would know, be sending terabytes worth of data from a single point to another network. Um, they do come at a, I mean, really, you know, 100 megabit, 10 megabit. The ones that we've been showing here, these are more at the one megabit scale. Um, and often you're dealing with control systems that are happy to dial, use a dial-up modem. Um, we have in our product uh, line here things that are about 10 times faster than that coming out um, in the near future here. But for the industrial side, you tend to need more stability than super high speed. Okay. Our next question from Jay Gallagher. Have you worked with TIC 3.0 architectures and their zone architectures? One concern I have is that a data dial acts similar to a firewall, making visibility below the dial level more difficult. However, does the solution compare to or complement deep packet inspection on a switch port? In theory, deep packet inspection will allow creating a baseline for what traffic is considered normal for control system or IoT, then building RBAC for the user and device. So the one of the exciting applications of diodes, and, and yes, they do limit visibility. You know, you're not going to get behind that diode. Um, it's a matter of where you put that um, inspection technology, whether it's, um, and it, this is from a variety of different approaches. We might be talking an intrusion detection system. We might be talking about something that's listening to electrical interference on a switch to detect uh, kind of ghost devices. Um, if you are doing that in an on-prem setting, getting that scanning happening, and you need to send the results of that, whether it's through log files or alerts, a diode could actually work really quite well as that single way out of that network so that other stakeholders can know that there's something happening or that there's nothing happening, um, but it can work well there. If, but if you're putting a diode in the middle of that, you're gonna be blocking off access behind it. So it's a matter of where you draw your boundary, what, where you wanna be implementing that technology. 
And, and Colin, if I could add to that, um, we tested some of that uh, within the lab. Um, you know, in, in a couple of scenarios, uh, we would mirror the data coming into one of the switches and then send that data to the diode for export out of our, you know, quote unquote network. Um, so in that kind of scenario, you could still have visibility uh, below the diode level. And then as Colin mentioned, you know, you can send the results from, from your um, IDS, IPS, um, or you can just do a port mirroring on, on, a, on a switch and, and have the diode just export the data. So uh, definitely a few different places within your network that you can place the diode in, and uh, not have any issues with that. Thank you. Our next question is from John Keane. Has anyone spoken to Dr. Ron Ross from NIST to determine if RMF is even appropriate to this device? You know, it's a, it's a really good question of uh, RMF applicability. Um, I have not sp spoken with Dr. Ross. Tapan, have you? Um, no, we haven't. Um, part of it does come down to um, how the DOD interprets and uh, implements the NIST and RMF guidance. Um, same thing with the TIG 3.0 architecture. Um, you know, I know CIS has, has put out that guidance out there. Uh, but we're still waiting for it to kind of make its way down through the different commands uh, through the army and, and particularly at the control system level. Um, you know, for those of you that work in the DOD, there's kind of a stark difference between the guidance that's out there for IT versus OT. And so some of these, um, you know, fairly well understood, well implemented things, even like net uh, uh, zero trust architecture, um, just haven't made their way into OT systems. So. It's a little bit difficult to implement because there's no guidance. And so when you try to do it, um, you just run into some hurdles. Um, so in, in both cases, um, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it, there's some, some challenges there. All right. Um, I think that concludes the questions that were put in the attendee chat. I will now go through the questions that were put into the audience questions um, submitted that way. Again, that is the preferred method so we can uh, visually show these questions as well. So we're now entering our, our Q&A mode. Um, so the next question we had is, since fiber light is regularly used for two-way high-speed network communication, what is different about this approach that actually prevent hackers to get in? So I think as, as part of the um, question there that, you know, light can be somewhat challenging to hack into, you know, but if somebody's, you know, there, there are technologies out there, you know, data taps, for example, for fiber optic that can make it kind of difficult to know that somebody has gotten into the network. They may even have uh, maybe something without a MAC address that is tough to detect. Um, in terms of, you know, there's two-way fiber optic, certainly there's one-way fiber optic. And the um, data diodes are more, more making sure that nobody's getting into that network, making sure that it is a using light that's only shining in one direction. And so there could be some really complex um, architectures that you could build yourself, you know, depending on how you have things set up. And in terms of things that, that's repeatable and uh, able to interact with a lot of different industrial control systems, you know, that and industrial control systems, there's a lot less fiber out there. There's a lot of copper. Um, when it comes down to it. All right, our next question is from Gary Reimar. <clears throat> Why would an optical diode <clears throat> like the one on the chart be so expensive? I think we actually did address this. This yeah. was in the attendee chat as well. Mm -hmm. So our next comment is from Patrick Graham. <clears throat> Comments on the data diode. DOD and IC have used them for years in two fashions, strictly as a hardware device that you described to combine continuous monitoring data as part of defensive cyber ops to funnel the data into an isolated enclave for analysis. Since the diode does not provide filtering and, and malware cannot leak out, this is okay. Second, they can combine systems in front and or in back of for filtering to prevent the transfer of mal malware. These dials must be on the approved NSA list. Yeah, Any comments based on Patrick's uh, comment? No, I think that that's, uh, you know, that points out that there are uh, some different 
and different needs. You know, there, if you need to get something on the NSA list, you've got to shop there. On the industrial control side, that's not necessarily where people are doing their shopping or specifying. Um, some some diodes will actually do uh, a bit of um, file file structure destruction if you're sending a zip file, for example, and try to reassemble that. And it can it can lead to some errors. You know, in our case, if somebody wants to send a file. Um, we're, we're letting the, the customer needs to be um, the one deciding what should be sent. We're not actually trying to filter that for whether or not it's classified. That's just not something that we put into ours. But you can combine diodes with systems that do that. Um, so I, I agree with the comments. And, and Colin, just if I could add here too, um, I think there's an, another question that along similar lines, um, you know, this particular project, we were interested in facility and building control systems. Uh, we were not looking at national security systems. You know, I, I think we would all agree that's a whole nother level uh, of analysis, applications, testing. Um, so, uh, you know, just want to make it clear this was for facility systems. A um, lot of, you know, what we look at for these types are, are usually on the low, uh, sometimes on the moderate level uh, on the CIA ratings. Um, you know, we're not, so, um, just want to make that clear, you know, we weren't looking at national security systems. Um, that's that's a whole different topic. Thank you. Thank you for making that distinction. That's important. Gary would like a copy of the reports. Um, so he provided his email. Um, and you also have the email of the presenters as well to reach out to them directly. Um, if for some reason you have trouble, you can always reach out to CSI. Act. We, we'd be happy to facilitate that as well. Uh, next question from, well, this is something that I think we addressed James' question as well in the, in the attendee chat. Mm -hmm. um, this one as well. I think this one too. Correct. Uh, from John, I think we just we just um, hit on this, but just to, to reemphasize, we'll, we'll, we'll speak to it again. As a DOD cross domain solution, this needs to be approved by DSOC for DOD use. Is that correct? Yeah, as Stefan was saying, you know, there's certainly different requirements for those IT networks for national security and then on the OT side. Correct. Very important distinction. Um, my background is actually um, in cross-domain solutions, so um, I can confirm that statement to be true. Um, we're not going to go into a specific uh, details about products, um, but there are similar technologies that are used in that space as well. Um, so that's something that we could talk about off offline. Um, but obviously the requirements are going to be um, a little different. Um, Gary thinks that you guys should uh, try to get approval. <laughs> yeah, well, they, well, let's, we'll definitely look at that one. I know there's been efforts to get a um, control systems trusted product list off the ground for, for several years. Um, and so this is uh, a, de a newer development or one that we may have missed. Certainly want to take a look at it. And I believe that is all of the questions that we have received um, through the attendee chat and through um, directly the audience questions. Um, with that said, we went slightly over by only three minutes, um, but I would like to thank Mr. Dunn and Mr. Patel for um, a great presentation. Obviously, we had a lot of membership feedback. Um, I foresee a lot more feedback as well once we do post um, this recording to our YouTube page as well. I will monitor our emails and send you any other feedback or questions that we do have. Um, but with that said, uh, I'll give you a chance to um, to kind of close out a little bit, but that's all we have from CSI Act this month. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining today and thank you, Philip, as well, for having us. Uh, thanks to Pam for joining and reach out if you have any additional questions. All right. Sounds good. Thanks you everybody for joining. Um, our next webinar, I believe, will be the 23rd of February, um, the digital transformation of SATCOM networks. Um, hope to see you guys uh, next month. Thank you.